So we're glad to have Terry here with Northwest Farm Credit. You know, that's one of the best things that we did. Uh, some of you may have seen an ad that we had a few years ago that you don't know what you don't know, right? We did not have Farm Credit as our banker a few short years ago. And as soon as we made that transition and got to deal with Terry and his crew, we wished that we had done that a long, long time ago. So we really, uh, they got kind of shortchanged in the presentation department. Sorry, Steve. No. <laughs> Steve's with the, the other bank, okay? So I'm not picking on you. But uh, they got kind of shortchanged in the presentation department last year. So we're glad to have them here with us this year. Uh, we have to be careful now. Our banker, who was here for the sale yesterday? So did you guys notice our banker was sitting right outside the ring there? <laughs> but the accountant wasn't here, so I think we're okay. But anyway, we're glad to have these guys here with us today. And uh, we want to be careful, too. We wanted to have the picture up of Terry. He's also not what you would think of as a banker, right? He's like this massive outdoorsman. And if you see Dad somewhere and you're curious, just ask him for the picture of the bear that Terry shot. I think it was, is it a world record or... Okay, so I mean, it's a big ass bear, right? I mean, so anyway, he's, uh, he's quite a varied guy in his interests and in, in experience. So with that, thank you guys for being here. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we'd like to thank the Foreman family for having us again this year. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to interact with you guys and uh, just do a little presentation. Uh, my name is Terry Hansen. I've been with Northwest Farm Credit Services about 38 and a half years now. Uh, my companion today is Scott Winkler. He's been with Farm Credit about five years. And we both uh, work out of the Moses Lake Washington office. Uh, I'm originally from Montana, the Great Falls area, Charlie Russell country. But I've spent most of my time with Farm Credit out of the Moses Lake office. Uh, I also run cattle myself. I have about 300 mother cows that I run, and I also have uh, some irrigated uh, farm ground that I operate as well. Uh, so I guess I have an opportunity sometimes to do the happy dance like you guys do, but most of the time, you know, do the crying and suffering and complaining, I guess. So anyway, I, I can uh, relate to you, what you guys go through every day because I do the same thing. So. Uh, today, we'd like to uh, make a presentation. Uh, we call it our peer financial benchmarks. And we try to do that on every commodity group. And today, we're going to talk about the cow-calf uh, peer financial benchmark uh, that Northwest Farm Credit Services has. And Scott's going to be the slide uh, operator. Uh, the purpose of uh, the peer benchmark uh, is to provide some valuable industry information both to us as a banker but to you as the operator of your operation. And it's intended to show a representative and unbiased cross-section of uh, our customers whose primary business is cattle ranching. Now, like I say, we do this on all the different commodity groups, but today we're gonna to be focusing on the cow-calf. Just some background, uh, the most recent data that we have is 2017, because those numbers are completed. 2018, even though we're getting close to the end, those numbers aren't finalized yet. So, we've, and we have some criteria that we base it on. Uh, 2,000 earnings are greater than or equal to $250,000. That's gross earnings, not net income. Uh, the size of the operation are between 300 and 3,000 head. And non-farm income is less than half of the cattle income. And the reason for that is because we feel like if it's more than that, it kind of skews the data. And uh, for comparison purposes, one animal unit is one cow or one bred heifer, and one yearling is 0.4 animal units. Right or wrong, those are the numbers that we use. Okay, the survey numbers includes 38 producers located in Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, in Nevada. 
and all the information on those producers is kept confidential. We don't associate any names with numbers, uh, and we, we pride ourselves on keeping that stuff very, very confidential. Otherwise, we you know, would have a, a lack of participation probably by the producers. I think it's key to look at here that 38 producers on the whole is not a huge number. Obviously, we work with a lot more cattlemen than that, but um, we've tried to drill down just cow-calf operations, try to drill down just that market. So that's why we factor in. If your non-farm income is significantly higher, it doesn't quite fit into what we're trying to get at here. So we're really trying to drive down to that specific market with these surveys, and that's why you see the, the specifics there outlined. And this is some of the survey questions. Uh, we try to have a, a running five-year comparison, and we try to use actual numbers, not estimates or projections. Uh, how many cows, yearlings, your current assets, total assets, the balance on your operating line, the current principal due, which would be like, you know, on your real estate payments, what portion of that real estate payment is the principal portion, uh, current liabilities, non-current liabilities, total liabilities, and then we get to what livestock product sales, and then Another one that's important is this earned livestock inventory change because changes in the, your inventory is income or it's loss of income. So you have to adjust for that. If you started the year with 300 cows and you ended the year with 320 cows, those 20 cows represents income to your operation. Conversely, if you started with 300 and you ended the year with 280, losing those 20 actually is a drop in your income and needs to be adjusted for. Uh, purchases for resale would be if you bought some uh, yearling heifers with the idea of breeding them and then selling them that fall, you would uh, put those in that category because they're really not part of your base herd operation. Um, gross profit, feed purchased, interest expense, which is what your banker makes his money off of, labor hired, vet and medicine costs, depreciation and amortization, and your total operating expenses get you to your net farm profit, then you have your net non-farm income, hopefully you have some income taxes, family living expense, and then you get what we call an adjusta EBITDA, and EBITDA is earnings before income tax and depreciation adjustment. Uh, and then total debt service requirements, principal and interest. And in that total debt service uh, requirement, that, that includes your payments and things like that. And then, we get to an animal units, and then we have an adjusted cattle income. That's a lot of information, but what I find is the more detail that we have and that we can use and that you keep, your true costs will, the variance between your true costs and, and an estimate will be very narrow. If you just use three or four deals, you're going to have a wider variance, which doesn't have as much meaning to, for you to compare to, say, your competitor or your other neighbors and things like that. You get what you put in, right? So, Yeah. Uh, we have some uh, slide presentations printed. I uh, didn't know how many to make because I didn't, wasn't sure how many. But if we don't have enough, if you give me your name and mailing address or an email address, we'll get all this stuff to you. And I promise we'll get it to you by Monday. So the big question is, where are you? And these different colors here have a meaning. Green is kind of like a safe zone. 
Yellow, is this like a yellow light at the traffic stop? It's, you know, you need to be aware where you're at. And then this one is kind of an orange. It's kind of like a further warning area. And if you notice, it's pretty skinny. And that's for a reason. And then the red or the orange, that's kind of the danger zone, I guess you'd call it. And these big squares here represent the, the range of the, the piers that we included. And then the dot is what the average actually is. And you can see that connecting the dots give us a trend line. So of everyone surveyed, these bars is kind of where the average is for the whole group surveyed. And then we can plot um, what the peer average is as a full complete average. And then we'll actually plot, see we don't have an individual in here, but we can actually plot where you're at on in relationship to that peer average, how, what quartile you basically fit in here. Um, and you can get a real in-depth view of not only a bunch of different variables, but how you fit along that path. So that's kind of the uh, basis for all of these charts. We have a few different charts to look at here. So. If we have your data, we can put that in there. And usually it's a kind of like a dark blue uh, line or, or section. And you can see where you fit if you're in the middle and you're, you're the upper end or the lower end or whatever. So I realize averages sometimes or what they are, an average, everybody's either above it or below it, but uh, when you're dealing with statistics, it always comes out, what's the average? Okay, on income, it's cattle income per animal unit. Once again, those big blocks across there are the, the range of the participants, and then the dots are the average, and you can kind of see as cattle prices were stronger, you had stronger income per unit. And then as they softened, we've seen that drop as, as, as well as you guys have experienced, I'm sure. So there's not a lot you can get other than kind of, A, what the dollar amount was in, in relationship to the average uh, from these, these next slides we're gonna be giving. But having that, your individual line charted out on there is where you would really get that value. So I mean, we want you to understand the product here, but we also know that there is some weakness in sharing to the mass here today. Cost trends is basically, uh, we use base operating expenses per animal unit. Uh, those kind of will fluctuate from year to year based on some weather influence, as well as inflation, uh, maybe some changes in your operation uh, that you've incorporated, which triggers some either additional expense or less expense. Uh, and then once again, we can plug your, your figures in there to see where you, where you're at. If you're in that middle 50% range or you're better than, than most, or if you're, you know, need some improvement in some certain areas to get you up into that middle quartile. Yeah, and so that's helpful for knowing where you're at individually in your operation. You know, if you, if you don't know that personally, go talk to your banker, whomever they are, and say, hey, what are my numbers and how do I compare? It can really give you a, an area to focus on and what, what's the quick fix for my operation or what area can I specifically improve right away with the most results. I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to see here is where can I attack first with the most bang for my buck? I like the comment that Rob made earlier was, was that he, just, he doesn't want to just be average. I mean, I would hope that most of you out there don't want to just be average, that you want to be above the average, have some kind of goal or, or target to shoot for. So that's kind of what I hear from a lot of producers that I finance with, that we do this kind of stuff. They, they say, I don't want to just be average. I want to be better than average. Okay, uh, certain operations go through an expansion phase. Uh, this will tell you kind of what that expansion does. Typically, the, the debt goes up because there was some debt incurred to do the expansion, whether it's 
actually buying the additional cows or converting some dry land to irrigation, things like that. Uh, the other thing is, okay, uh, pay down debt, uh, debt to asset ratio. Basically a debt to asset ratio, if you don't know what that is, it's what percentage of your, for every dollar of uh, assets that you own, what percentage of debt do you have against that dollar? In other words, if your debt to asset ratio is 48%, that means for every dollar of your asset, there's 48 cents that's owed to a creditor on that asset. Working capital, for instance, cash, that's basically what working capital is. It's, I look at it as kind of the shock absorber on your car, that when you hit a rut, it kind of takes some of it out. Working capital is the same way. It's the difference between your, your current assets and your current debts. It's kind of the margin there that you have working in your operation to keep it moving forward. And a current asset basically is those assets that normally are converted to cash or consumed in the operation during the normal operating cycle. And current liabilities or current debts are those debts and payments that have to be made during a normal operating cycle. Just two, two slides here to show. One is a basically working capital is a dollar amount. Um, you can look at that as a ratio as well. Uh, and so we have two charts to kind of depict that. As you can see in those two slides, working capital has kind of had a downward trend line. And I guess that's kind of a, a signing of the times, it's costing a little more to operate, and the income is not keeping pace with that increase in those expenses, and the difference comes out of your working capital or that slush fund, I guess you'd call it. Okay, we have uh, actually 14 available comparison charts. Uh, we can do it on a total animal unit basis, term debt to animal unit, your debt service on an animal unit basis, what your working capital is, what your working capital is on an animal unit basis, what your net worth is, which is your equity in your assets, gross farm income, operating expense ratio, in other words, what percentage uh, is your expenses to your income, and if that gets above a certain level, that's kind of something that you need to focus on to get that down. If it's a low number, that means you're a very efficient operator. You're only, I guess, spending the funds for those expenses that make sense to do. Uh, cattle income per animal unit. Debt coverage ratio, that's an important uh, ratio there. That basically says when everything is flushed out, what do you have available to make your debt payments? And you want that to be greater than one to one, and most banks want it to be significantly greater than one to one, like one and a half to one or something like that. So that with fluctuations in expenses or prices, you still have enough left to make your payments. The, the kind of the point of this slide is to just show you, um, because we're all pretty visual, at least I am, and so these are all physical charts and graphs that we can show you and say, okay, here's where you are on that line. Here's how you match up. That's really handy because you guys might not care about the individual numbers as much. I mean, they mean something. It's important, but seeing it on that chart is helpful, and, and these are just available graphs that show that. There are actually just 29 different data points that have a peer average comparison. When you give us that list of all that information, all those financial figures, we can plug those in there and really drive down what you look like compared to your peers. And that's helpful because, like I said, then it helps you pick the most important or the, the highest variances to where you can really get those back in line with what your peers are doing. Plus, it'll show you what areas you really are shining in, what areas maybe you uh, should focus on trying to make some improvements in and some areas that maybe are 
taking away from those areas that you really shine in. So it's, like I say, you get into numbers and statistics and everything. Uh, it can kind of be boring, but yet, if you, if you do it and take the, the good from it, it does actually help you in some of your decisions. It helps you know what trail your operation is going on. Uh, you, you know long before the banker tells you you got a problem, things like that. I mean, if, if the banker has to tell you, hey, you got a problem, and, and you don't realize that you, you, you definitely have a problem, I would say. Okay, this slide here kind of shows, you know, once we get all the, the data entered and we can do the trend, what, how it breaks out on all those different 14 points that we talked about on the previous slide. That's why I had him come do that because I, I would be doing that on every slide. Okay, there you go. I can say th th those are the 14 areas that we kind of focused on. We kind of went through it fast, but uh, we, yeah, we, we know you're probably thinking of the food deal, but uh, any questions on what some of those ratios mean or what some definitions mean or anything like that? I, I see a, a lot of blank faces, so that scares me, I guess. <laughs> Except Steve there, he knows what it's about. <laughs> Yeah, bankers, they, they, they're always wanting numbers. They're always wanting numbers. But the, the thing is, numbers are like snapshots. They're, they're able to show different points in time. And, you know, where you, where you started from, where you came from, where you're at, where you're headed. Plus, they're very valuable for making decisions, you know, prudent decisions, too. I think that's where the real benefit is, is when you put your numbers on there to see where you are. Like that one slide says, where are you? Uh, then we're able to do that. And we can do that on an individual basis. So anyway, that's kind of quick, but uh, like I say, we'll be here the rest of the day if you have any questions.